Hello, this is Dr. Grande. Today's question asks if I can analyze the mental health and personality factors that may be at work in the John DuPont case. Just a reminder, I'm not diagnosing anybody in this video, only speculating about what could be happening in a situation like this. If you enjoy this video, please like it, subscribe to my channel, and consider supporting me on Patreon. I'll put the link to Patreon in the description for this video. So here I'll be looking at John DuPont's background, moving to the crime, and then I'll talk about the mental health and personality factors. John DuPont was born in Philadelphia, Pennsylvania on November 22, 1938. The DuPont family is well known for being wealthy. They own a number of businesses, including a chemical company. The family is also known for their ability to get out of trouble using money. The family has a long history of scandals and criminality, as well as many accusations of narcissism. John DuPont was raised on an 800-acre estate in Newtown Square, Pennsylvania. He was lonely growing up. His mother actually paid the son of the chauffeur to pretend to be his friend. He lost his testicles after a horse riding accident when he was young. DuPont had an interest in birds and natural science. In 1957, he founded the Delaware Museum of Natural History, and he would go on to study biology at the University of Miami. He graduated with a bachelor's degree in 1965. In 1973, he earned a doctorate in natural science from Villanova University. DuPont also had an interest in stamps. He bought many throughout his life and continued to buy them even after he was in prison. He purchased one particular stamp that is thought of as one of the rarest in the world. He paid $935,000 for it at an auction in 1980. So perhaps money management skills weren't his strong suit. In 1983, he was married. He thought his wife was a Russian spy. There are reports that he did a number of things to her. For example, he threatened her, attempted to stab her, strangled her, pushed her out of a moving car, and threw her into a fireplace. Not surprisingly, that marriage didn't work out. Evidently, DuPont interpreted the phrase, until death do us part, as a challenge. In the late 1980s, he funded a wrestling program at Villanova, but it was shut down after just two years because of some allegations of misconduct against DuPont. He then opened a wrestling facility on his property in Newtown Square, calling it Team Foxcatcher. So it appears as though John was caught for bad behavior in an environment controlled by somebody else, so he built his own place where perhaps he was much less limited by rules. After his mother died in 1988, he invited wrestlers to live on his property and train there for competitive events like the Olympics. Arguably the most famous wrestler he invited was Dave Schultz, an Olympic and world champion in wrestling. We see that for a while DuPont is living on the estate, the wrestlers are living there as well. They are training, traveling to various events, hanging out, raising families, and overall having a good deal of success in the sport of wrestling. Over time, though, DuPont grew increasingly bizarre, odd, and paranoid. By many accounts, he was always a bit different in terms of his level of social skill. He didn't have much, but his behavior worsened in the early and mid-90s. The wrestlers actively tried to pacify DuPont. They tried to keep him happy and out of trouble. This makes sense, given that they really had a good thing going on there. They were being paid a salary, allowed to live on the estate for free. They could train in this advanced facility. They were traveling all over the world. This allowed them to be much better at wrestling. They felt not only personally rewarded, but they felt they were doing something good for the sport of wrestling. As DuPont grew more paranoid, he developed certain unusual beliefs, which were kind of hard to miss. He thought that there were mechanical trees and deer on the property. He thought the trees were uprooting themselves and walking around. He thought people were spying on him. He believed that some of the wrestlers were conspiring against him. He removed the treadmills from every building on the estate because he thought they were transporting him back in time. He said that he saw ghosts in the walls of his house. He believed that Disney characters were hiding on the estate. He thought that geese were using dark magic against him, so he shot at them. He believed that there were underground tunnels in the house that people used to get in and out undetected. He started accumulating firearms and carrying firearms with him as he moved about the estate. Twice he drove Lincoln Continentals into a pond on the property, trying to block entrances to secret passageways. 
He developed a fixation on the color black. He banned black vehicles from the property, and he fired three black wrestlers from the team. Now, some have said that he did this because he was racist, but reports indicate it really was due to some delusional fear about the color black. He also started using alcohol and cocaine. DuPont hired a security team and had them investigate certain potential sources of concern, like making sure there weren't cameras or other machines in trees or in the ground. They went along with John, even though he was clearly mentally ill. That's really one of the themes of John DuPont's life. Everybody was going along with him, and few people were standing up to him and saying, look, what you believe is clearly delusional. Nobody wanted to disrupt or terminate the flow of money, and I think many people also genuinely liked John DuPont. At one point during the mid-90s, we see that DuPont pulled a gun on a wrestler. That wrestler went to the police, and the police chose not to investigate, essentially being dismissive of the situation, saying something like, oh yeah, that sounds like John DuPont. Now moving to the murder, January 26, 1996, DuPont retrieves a camera and a 44 Magnum and gets into the driver's seat of a vehicle with his head of security in the passenger seat. He drives over to the house where Dave Schultz lives. Dave, who is fixing his car, starts walking toward John DuPont down the driveway and says something like, hi boss or hi coach. DuPont fired three shots from the vehicle as he screamed, you got a problem with me. All three bullets struck Dave Schultz. Schultz would die a few minutes later. The head of security jumped out of the car and drew a weapon from an ankle holster, but failed to fire at John DuPont. DuPont drove back to his house. DuPont was arrested after hiding in his house for two days. The police shut off a boiler and John DuPont went outside the house to fix it. That's when they caught him. Amazingly, the police did not try to make entry during the standoff, sparking accusations that they had become a little too friendly with DuPont. This accusation does make sense considering DuPont donated quite a bit of money to the local police and regularly allowed them to practice shooting on a range he maintained on his estate. DuPont would plead not guilty by reason of insanity. A mental health expert for the defense said that DuPont had schizophrenia and he was not responsible for his actions. He was found guilty of third-degree murder but mentally ill on February 25, 1997. In Pennsylvania, this charge means that somebody did not have the intent to kill. He was sentenced to 13 to 30 years in prison. He was denied parole in 2009 and on December 9, 2010, he died at age 72. Now moving to the mental health and personality factors. So we see that John DuPont was diagnosed with schizophrenia. This disorder has five symptom criteria. Two or more are required for a diagnosis. One of those two must be from the first three in the list. So with these five, we see delusions, hallucinations, disorganized speech, grossly disorganized or catatonic behavior, and negative symptoms like diminished emotional expression, or a volition. It would appear that DuPont had delusions, hallucinations, and negative symptoms. It's not clear if he had disorganized speech or grossly disorganized behavior. In addition to the symptom criteria, he also met the other criteria of the disorder, like the symptoms were present for at least six months and they were not better explained by another disorder. One of the difficulties with recognizing or understanding schizophrenia is how it runs in phases. There is a prodromal phase, then there's an active phase, where we would expect to see those symptoms I mentioned, and after this there is a residual phase. So the disorder kind of cycles through these phases as somebody has it, and the phases can cycle very quickly or quite slowly. Many people who have the disorder spend quite a bit of time in the prodromal and residual phases. During these phases we would expect odd or bizarre thoughts and behaviors, these are attenuated active phase symptoms, so they are versions of those symptoms that are not as severe. The outcomes from having schizophrenia are highly variable, meaning some people with schizophrenia can barely function at all, whereas other people seem to do pretty well. The outcomes are heavily dependent on how long somebody stays in a psychotic state. This is referred to as the duration of untreated psychosis. It is a powerful predictor of progress. A long duration predicts that somebody will not recover very well, and a short duration means the outcome will probably be better. The people who were around John DuPont probably believed they were protecting their own interests by not sounding the alarm about DuPont's behavior, 
they also probably believed that they were helping John DuPont, like keeping him out of trouble, keeping him out of a mental health facility where he would lose his freedom. In reality, they did everybody a disservice. If John DuPont had been treated earlier, this would have ended a lot differently. I think what may have happened is the people saw the active phase and they became frightened. But then John DuPont would move into a residual phase and then go back around into a prodromal phase. In those phases, the symptoms didn't seem quite as bad. So the people around him probably thought, okay, he was just going through a tough time. Now he's back to his old self. Now DuPont's illness expressed in other ways that also represented an obstacle to him getting help. He manipulated people on the estate, playing one person against the other. John became particularly manipulative when he noticed other people were becoming close with one another. He became jealous. When people would confront him, when they would stand up and say, this is delusional or this doesn't make sense, they would be met with resistance immediately. So this really discouraged any type of helpful behavior. People just stopped confronting him. He hired security staff, and I think this really led to a lot of problems. They tried to pacify him by responding to all his delusions. As I mentioned before, they were tearing the place apart looking for spy equipment. They probably thought that when John DuPont saw there was no electronic equipment buried in the ground or concealed in other places, he would be satisfied. But that is not how delusions work. Those security personnel, and really just about everybody on the estate, did not understand how schizophrenia expresses. When they followed John's instructions, when they gave in to his delusional thinking, they actually reinforced his behavior. There was no reason to believe that anybody on that estate would have mental health training. But even outside of that, anyone should have known that certain behaviors were unacceptable. For example, John thought that he was a Russian czar, a top CIA operative. He believed that international assassins were trying to kill him. He also referred to himself as the Dalai Lama. During his trial, he even argued with his attorneys, saying that he should have diplomatic immunity because of that. One of the best examples is this incident where John threatened the wrestler with a gun. The police did not investigate. There's no way to justify the lack of response here. They should have investigated, and DuPont should not have had access to any weapons. People wonder why DuPont killed Dave Schultz. There have been many theories. The two main theories being that he thought David Schultz was a Russian spy and Dave was getting ready to leave DuPont's employment and go to work for somebody else. So DuPont felt betrayed. It's really hard to know what exactly was going on. Again, it's clear that John DuPont was delusional, so there may not have been any obvious external cause to his behavior. What I find really interesting about DuPont selecting Dave Schultz is that Dave really had the closest relationship to John DuPont. Yet, John DuPont murdered him. It supports the idea that it's impossible to reason with somebody who is delusional. Dave may have felt that he was safer by keeping John DuPont close. Like the classic phrase, keep your friends close and your enemies closer. But that phrase does not apply to people who are delusional. Delusions and firearms do not mix well together. After DuPont's incarceration, he ordered all the buildings on his estate to be painted black. He did this in an effort to get released from prison. He believed people in the community would be disturbed by the darkness of the buildings and demand his release so that he would repaint them back to their original color. I'm really surprised that his staff actually repainted the buildings. I would have expected them to be on the phone with him and say, oh yeah, John, we painted those buildings. What else do you need? It's like they forgot he was in prison and couldn't observe whether the buildings were ever painted black or not. It seems incredibly wasteful to spend all that time and money to do something clearly ridiculous and for a purpose that would never be fulfilled. Obviously, his plan about the community getting upset and forcing his release was not based in any logic or reason. This incident notwithstanding, John DuPont's condition did not actually worsen in prison. He stayed about the same. John DuPont was a lonely, socially awkward, bizarre, and eccentric individual who was granted great freedom Wealth ultimately facilitated the creation of a toxic environment, enabled him to commit murder, and prevented him from getting help. So his wealth really didn't pay off for him. It just enabled the delusions to be expressed in a more profound and destructive way. This is a story of two prominent mental health symptoms, paranoia and denial. John DuPont had the paranoia, and many of those around him 
were in a state of denial. People see what they want to see. Nobody wanted the party to end. Nobody wanted to face the truth. One of the most amazing quotes I've heard regarding this case was a person who spent time on the estate saying they racked their brain trying to find signs that things were going wrong. When concerns about mechanical trees, geese with dark magic, and time-distorting treadmills don't convince people that something's wrong, nothing will. Those are my thoughts about the John DuPont case. Please put any opinions and thoughts in the comments section. They always generate an interesting dialogue. As always, I hope you found my analysis of this topic to be interesting. Thanks for watching.